is a uh, let's call this a mashup. It is the Bill Highway Mariner traditional a webinar combined with our virtual swap because it's July and why should we have two events when we can do one? And the question we want to figure out is what is next? I mean, we know that at least here in Maryland, almost most of the places are now saying absolutely no in-person through the end of the year. That's going to have an impact. I know D.C. is probably going to follow, certainly California, which has recently shut back down again. So, man, so many things for us to, to take a look at. So just a couple of little quick things. This, of course, is the series that Bill Highway and Mariner put together. The Bill Highway team is on leave. Oh, my gosh. They actually think we can handle this. Of course we can. Um, but a good uh, nod out to the Bill Highway team. And um, they are doing some amazing things. Just launched, just went live with another association on their technology solution. So look for some cool case studies coming out of that. And of course, Mariner is are your partners here in all things chapters and volunteers. <laughs> As always, our goal here is to build the community and the content. Um, that's why um, I put in the chat at the very beginning, we will be using our virtual flip chart again, a Google Doc, which by the way is the rolling notes. So if you've missed any of our previous virtual swaps, please take a look, just scroll down in there because it's absolutely wonderful. And yes, Diana, it is a, it is a CEX um, a, a picture, so very good. And i got some exciting news about CEX coming up in just a moment. Um, so Peter and I on the 31st head out for some R&R. Um, &R. We're going to the place we always go, the lake house. We have to take lots of masks because it's in Pennsylvania and they're being very picky for good reasons. Um, but what are your vacation plans? Let's go ahead and um, continue. I love um, quesadillas, Michelle. Awesome. Um, so let us know where you're going. Um, today's agenda. What is today's agenda? Well, three simple things. We want to talk about lessons learned. Now, if you've been on our other swaps and you've been looking at the virtual chat, you kind of know the lessons we've been learning because all we're doing is reflecting back what we've heard. One of the things that we've also looked at is in how you take those lessons, how can you act? have a couple of ideas there to share for you. But the bulk of it is going to be the let's talk section in which we actually say, okay, what are we going to do over the next six to nine to 12 months to help our folks? So <clears throat> the conversation, of course, is not a one day. Super excited to let you guys know if you haven't already heard the fabulous news is that um, CEX is going virtual. It's going to be the afternoons of the 26th and 27th on your Zoom platform. You can dial in in your PJs or in your, in your business suit attire. It's all good. We're going to use a meeting platform so we can do some breakouts and have good conversations. $99 pricing. We, we're, we ratcheted back just to cover um, the piece that we're going. So um, by all means, please, please, please plan. Um, love to have you for both days. Um, if you can make one day or the other, just you know, go ahead. You know everybody who registers. We share all the details afterwards. How many of you are going to ASAE Annual Virtual? Um, now that it's free, and yes, folks, if you didn't hear, it is free. They have now reduced the registration to the wonderful zero. If you go, two things to put on your calendar. The first is um, bridging the gap between chapters and national. That's going to be on Monday at 2.30. That features, it's really a program coming out of the component section council. It features Brian Calvary with the Consortium for School Networking, Brenna Myers for, um, from the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, and a cool dude that, of course, you've seen on some of our stuff, Wes Carr from RAPS. So super cool. Now, Peter and I are leading a conversation on that Wednesday at 11 a.m. on how 2020 reshaped chapters. A um, little bit of an alert. We built in chats. Um, we may be the only group, the only presenters who are building in chats like we're doing a live one, so please come and have your fingers um, warmed up. Of course, in September comes our webinar, and we will be scheduling the virtual idea swap. Um, so lots of cool things coming up um, just in the next couple of months as we continue the conversation. Um, anyway, 
let's find out a little bit about what's going on in your life. So I want to go ahead and launch a poll for us, and I want you to answer this first question about as a whole, thinking about your whole chapter system, um, how are chapters faring? Okay, are you are they is it system struggling? Are some of them holding their own? Many steady on course, um, and are there any thriving? I mean, some folks maybe they're finding like this. Finally, I've landed in a spot where I'm so useful that it makes a bit, tremendous difference. Now, I will tell you that some people would say, Peggy, why are you putting thriving on that list? And I will tell you that we've talked with a couple of associations who are finding that many of their chapters are, in fact, thriving. So we've got a, about 60% of you in. Let's go ahead and keep going. Now, add into the chat why you answered struggling, holding their own, studying. I love it. Say thank you, John, for, for joining that. Um, which I need to hopefully we'll get footing now. Yes, tax season. There's always these ebbs and flows. I know with um, the AGC uh, chapters, the general contractors, you know, getting their getting their sites open again was a was a big thing. So we've got all those kinds of things. All right. So let me end this poll and show you what I've got. Um, so I love this that about 69% of you are saying holding their own. That's the number one. We got a couple that are steady, large on course. So if you've said steady, tell us what's helping them be steady, because I think that that's kind of the that's the that's the place from which we can really um, from which we can really have some fun here. Now let me ask you a second question. So that was really guys about your chapters, right? I want to find out what's ho what's happening with your own uh, in your own shop, so to say. So how are you and your department faring? Are basically it's um, sort of status quo, no changes in staffing or budget, things are moving forward. Did you get an increase in staffing or budget? You know, some of the organizations talk about how they've been able to get some additional dollars to be able to support the chapters. But maybe like so many associations, you're seeing a decrease in staffing or budget. And maybe you're just not sure because you're kind of in one of those waters where it's kind of up and down. So, and, and you know, this is not, you know, it, it's it's whatever, it's what, however you're feeling today. So, pretty much status quo. Things are kind of percolating and uh, some cool things, and maybe that. Yeah, Jenny. See, that's the problem. If you're in an industry like you are with hospitality and sales and marketing, man, this must be tough because so many folks are are um, are furloughed and wow. So. Um, but so how long can they survive? I think that's an important question for all of us to ask. We've got a couple more folks coming in here, so I'm going to give you a moment. So what's really interesting is not, which is not surprising, is that there's kind of a, this um, um, almost a split between no changes and decreased staffing. So if you put down decreased, um, uh, do you think it's going to come back in 21? Do you think it's permanent? If you put no changes, I just saw the message Diana put in, do you think that those are coming in 2021 and are you having to go ahead and um, – and sort of navigate that in advance because that's a that's a part where we can begin to we can begin to talk about how does the community support ourselves. Um, anyway, so many of you are dealing with that combination of you know what's kind of on the horizon. Um, so let's take that information that we've got that you guys have shared. Whoops. I and, and launch into a little bit of a conversation about what we can reflect back to you about what we're learning. And so I'm going to turn this over to uh, Peter and share a little bit about what we've been collecting and hearing. So it has been an interesting time. Uh, I'm sure Charles Dickens would have had a lot of fun <laughs> with this adventure that we're in right now. But it, it, there, there are a couple of things that have really struck out, st stuck out t to us. And, and the first one, and perhaps the most important, is that, that people really matter. People are everything. Uh, we, we've found that the, the chapters that are doing well are led by people who have the mental flexibility and, and the, the passion to really take, it, take a look at what's going on and see it not as a disaster, but as an opportunity to do things that perhaps they hadn't thought of before and to really build on the value proposition in a, in a very different way from what had been 
their their past operating structure. And of course, the other side of this is that all of a sudden people have discovered that reserves are critical. Uh, you've, you've probably heard in, in the world of business this notion of just in time, and we, we have a supply chain that's really built on just making exactly how much we need and keeping just the minimum amount in in reserves so that we can make things as they as they are purchased. And we've all all of a sudden we're having to switch to just in case. And this notion of having maybe a couple months of reserves in the in the bank probably doesn't fly too well now. And it, it'll be interesting to see to what extent we chapters and associations generally begin to think very differently about what is considered an acceptable amount of reserves. But I, I want to just reemphasize that that really having the right people in leadership roles is absolutely critical because those people tend to do the things that that allow them to to be successful. Uh, a couple of great examples, uh, the Associated General Contractors, whom you'll hear we mention a number of times. Uh, they're a pretty extraordinary group. Uh, the, the executive director of the Texo uh, chapter in Dallas-Fort Worth turned around and looked at her members and said, you know something, they need PPE. Now, what association is in the business of getting PPE to its membership? Well, they decided that's what their members need, so that's what they did. And they went out and they developed a supply chain of PPE, and they began delivering that, making that available to their members. So it was all of a sudden, it was something that was totally outside of their strategic plan. Uh, it was not inside of any of their operational plans. It was not something they did at all. But it was that they, they said, how can we help our members be successful right now? This is what our members need. We're going to get it for them. Um, so that, that was – I, I thought that was both an example of, of the mental flexibility to, to pivot, but also of the, the tenacity to say, we're going to find a way to make this happen. And that was, that was a really a matter of the executive director saying, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to, I've never done this before, but I'm going to figure it out. Um, another group that we've seen some pivoting on, and this is sort of an interesting uh, switch, it's not so much the chapter itself, but the profession looked at the current situation and said we need, we need to do something different. And this is the appraisal industry or appraisal profession. Uh, the Appraisal Qualifications Board, which is the standard setting body of the industry or the profession, said you can take any of your in-person classes that have been approved for continuing education and make them virtual. I stick a camera in front of somebody and have them do the class that way. Not ideal, but uh, they said, we're going to let you do that, and we're going to give you CE for that instead of having you resubmit everything through our system, which is much more rigorous when it comes to, to virtual education. So that was sort of a profession or an industry pivot, which I think is equally important, uh, that, that all of a sudden allowed the associations to keep delivering that value to their members because they need that continuing education to maintain their license and obviously to stay on top of, of what's going on. And I think the uh, dental hygienists did, did something pretty extraordinary. Peggy, why don't you tell us about uh, their little their little pivot? Yeah, so, and they're having a, a um, wonderful member growth at the moment, at least. Uh, one of the things that they did was they really shifted – um, they or they really focused their attention in two spaces, and one was the advocacy to make sure the environment was safe for the dental hygienist to get what? back to work. I'm listening to. And a they had to do chapter. They, <laughs> they had to do a <laughs> lot of, um, of 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 securing, <laughs> helping people get there, being able to do that. And the second thing they did was they recognized that dental hygienists have a very limited voice, and so they spent a lot of time on the health and the wellness conversations to help the dental hygienist really be prepared but also feel more comfortable. So it was really amplifying parts of what they normally did by just saying these are the priorities right now. So those are just a couple of examples of, of organizations that said we need, to, we need to be different than we were if we're going to succeed, and most importantly, if we're going to deliver value to our members. Uh, one of the other fundamental changes that we've seen is this blurring of geographic uh, boundaries, and that has really changed the relationship not just between between the chapters and, and headquarters, between the chapters and each other. Uh, a couple of examples, uh, the recycling community, which is primarily a state and local focused uh, uh, process and, and, and profession, um, has started converting many of their conferences to virtual conferences, and now they're, they're sort of broadcasting that availability nationwide. So now the, the state boundaries, which used to 
differentiate the Maryland Recycling Network from the Virginia Re Recycling Network, from the Indiana Recycling Network, those boundaries are going away. And we're all of a sudden competing with each other in ways that really hadn't happened before. And I, I'm not really sure we've thought this through and said, okay, how do we make the math work for everybody? And, and I'm going to go back to the Association or Contract just because the Austin chapter did something extraordinary. Uh, they had a, train, a safety training program that they put together, the, the, the Austin chapter. Um, and they, this is a, a program, it, it runs four weeks, one day each week, and they charge and get $1,295 for members to attend this virtual training. So they offered this out there, and all of a sudden they found people from other AGC chapters, not in Austin, California, New York, etc., who were signing up for this program. And what they did, which I thought was really speaks to the, the, the value of community and the value of, of trust, was they said, okay, we're going to give a $300 rebate to every chapter whose member attends our program. And this program sold out, and they're going to offer it again, and they'll probably sell out again. So when you think about, A, can we make money with, with virtual? Well, you know, they're 1295 bucks for members. It's a pretty, pretty high price point, compelling content. Uh, but they also have found a way to cross those geographic lines, but do so, so in a way that is respectful of their, their fellow chapters. And obviously, lots of associations are beginning to see – the chapters and the headquarters beginning to compete with each other in ways that they hadn't done before. So I think this is a, a deep conversation that, that associations are going to have to get their arms around in fairly quick order uh, as things keep moving forward. And of course, then the, uh, the, the other aspect of chapters, which has always been critical, is, is this is a, in many cases, there's a local conversation. And I think this is where that local problem solving can, can be critical. And particularly where and I'll give the recycling community as an example. There are, they, recycling is truly a local conversation. The regulations, the legislation, by and by and large, is either state or or county or municipality. And so this is where the the members depend even more upon the the local entity to to really help them understand what's going on. And for example, as what was defined as an essential business was defined differently depending upon where you were. And everybody was trying to figure that out. Uh, the appraisers, for example, were going, gee, am I an essential business? Gee, when I do an appraisal, can I go into a building, into a home? These are all local conversations. There wasn't any national policy around this. The same thing on the recycling front. Uh, are we an essential business? Can we, can we go pick stuff up? Can we have people bring stuff to us? You know, these are all difficult questions, and, and this is where the local chapter was critical to helping the members understand what was, what was acceptable and, and what was not acceptable. Uh, and, and last but not least, I think the other big lesson for us is that the traditional chapter probably needs to think differently about its future. I, I think this is maybe a nail in the coffin for a lot of chapters who weren't flexible enough to make the kinds of changes that would allow them to adapt and to continue develop bringing member value to the members, but more importantly, to adapt and create new value for the members based upon the, the new, new normal that we're operating in right now. Peggy? Yes, so I'm, it's a great conversation uh, happening in the chat. And um, I think that, you know, as you were talking, Peter, there's just a lot of um, – Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I, I think there's two things I just want to highlight real quickly is, you know, because all of the of the virtual shift, you know, Aaron said, well, hmm, that's a that's a big question. Will it be fatigue and how can they sustain it? And that will that really be a substitute for non dues revenue? And there was an interesting piece, a couple of pieces now, but one on the member suite blog about um, really pivoting to embrace content management and how do I make how do I make dollars off of content and I think that's an interesting space where maybe our chapters haven't explored completely. I had a really good conversation with uh, Tracy's groups uh, at, at NARI in which we were talking about, and many of them have some solid, I mean, just incredible content. So the question is, how do they pivot and make that part of the non-dues revenue? So I think that's a real, that's a really. Um, important and increasing question and 
Um, John, the other thing I wanted to mention was you posted, yeah, and one of the things that we need to do is, and maybe one of our support mechanisms, how do we help them do really good virtual so that they ignore all the other stuff and go to our chapter stuff. I think that's really important. Peter, do you want to add something? Yeah, I think there's another uh, conversation to be had here, and that goes back to this notion of uh, the sponsorships. And sponsors tend to look at their sponsorship as event-centric. They, they think, oh, well, you had 100 people show up for this meeting, and the, that, was, that was my audience. And one of the things that's happened as the chapters have pivoted to a virtual, more virtual model is not only are they seeing some of the, norm, the people they usually saw, they're actually beginning to see people they didn't see. Uh, we're hearing from a lot of chapters that, that members who never show up for anything all of a sudden showed up for their, their virtual program about whatever it may have been. And, and I think that's a bonus in some respects for sponsors who are saying, we want to reach a broader audience, and I think this is certainly an opportunity to, to, to do exactly that. And the question becomes, how do we price that sponsorship, and how do the sponsors monetize the potential value of a sponsorship that's purely vir virtual? And I think that's where it's going to be you know, industry and profession dependent, uh, but it's also more importantly going to be a place where I think the, the chapters and the, and the associations, the headquarters, need to have conversations with the, with the sponsorship community and really help clarify you know, what, what sponsorship models make sense. Because obviously we still need to make money somewhere along the line. We have to pay for the stuff that we do. Uh, but the question becomes, can we do it in such a way that it's truly a win-win-win, so that the, the, that the sponsor makes out, the chapter makes out, and most importantly, the member makes out as a result of, of that conversation. Right. So, and that's a great segue to, um, because there's other ways for your sponsors to get involved, so there's a, that's a great way to talk about how can we act. And um, one of the things that we've learned and we've heard, people spending some more time on a couple of, on, on four areas in particular we just wanted to highlight. And one of them is this notion of supporting our volunteers. And I think that we've all, particularly those of us on the call, I mean, we understand the importance of being there for our volunteers, helping them move along, giving them tools and resources. But now we may have to go an even further distance, right? Now we have to do more just in time because people need to really under, they, they say, I, I have to do this. Oh my gosh, I have to, I have to do this, um, this virtual. I have to pivot this to virtual. I don't know how to do it. Or um, I don't know how to make money on a virtual meeting. Or I don't know how to make money on my content. Or I don't know how to rethink my volunteer model because I can't get people to commit right now. So how do I think about how doing things differently? So ramping up the leadership training is going to be really important. And there are some really cool um, examples out there. Just to share a couple of them, I had a, a, an incredible conversation. I'm going to have to write it up and share more of it with the American Organization for Nursing Leadership. And I talked with um, a number of their staff members. And one of the um, the really cool conversations we had was around their um, leadership path, which is a, um, a really interesting, completely virtual um, six-month um, learning cohort. And um, what they do is it's entirely on their LMS, uh, which they happen to use as top class. Um, and they already had some of that stuff going on, but they were mostly using their LMS as part of, and this is I thought was interesting, mostly using their LMS as part of a hybrid scenario. So for a lot of their training courses, you would have a video or something you had to read before you got to the room, and then, the, and then they had a number of their, facil their, their, their instructors are quite quite um, expert at this, and then they would use that data to form, to, to form the content for the day. So they were kind of used to that, but they have a leadership cohort that is completely virtual, um, and they use the LMS to have the discussions, to have the capstone project, and to have these modules. And what's really kind of neat is that they have these Several times in the course of this, they have these, um, they have these um, gatherings, so, so phone gatherings, right, where you have a conversation about what you've learned. What's neat about this is that this is a six-month uh, um, investment that a volunteer makes. They get CE for all of this, right, for their credentialing. They're building leadership skills. So this cohort is not about um, how do I book a meeting, right? 
Um, it's not about the technical aspects of being a nurse leader. It's truly about building out your capacity. And so one of the cool things about that is, first of all, this is eminently sponsorship, sponsorable, right? Um, but secondly, it's taking that learning. Instead of us doing a, a leadership conference, not instead of, but you know how we do a leadership conference and we have a day or a two days, used to be in person. How do we build that out to a longer cohort, right? So just a really different thing for you to think about. Now, let's say you don't have an LMS. We've been working with the uh, ASFMRA, which is the – Peter can fill in all. It's the uh, 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 farm, uh, farm managers and the real estate uh, – ag- Rural appraisers. <laughs> there you go. Um, anyway, what they're doing to help their leaders get these really necessary skills is they've built um, using – pulling from YouTube. We have another organization that uses LinkedIn Learning. So there's lots of really good content out there that allows us to ramp up the leadership development, to give our leaders access to information that sharpens their skills and gets them thinking differently. (coughs) Second thing we have to do is we have to create this um, education strategy. We have uh, we've worked with reps for quite a quite a few years now, and one of the really cool things about um, what reps has done is they basically have said, okay, chapters, um, we've got a ma- we've got a master calendar of all the learning that's available in fr- from the system, and um, you can do whatever virtual learning makes sense for your cohort, and we put it on the master calendar. Um, and so what they're saying is we can't, we as the organization, we can't do all of the training that our pe- people need right now. We know you can do it. We know you are no longer have face-to-face, but we're going to have, we're going to sit back and we're going to have an education strategy that is global in nature and plug that in. So it's almost seamless when you're looking at what do I need, I've got lots of opportunities. Would that work for you? I don't know. The point here is that they sat down and they said, we have to have a strategy. We, don't, we want to try to minimize um, competition, maximize collaboration, but we also want the entire community to know that we're, that we're all offering education, that we're in this education journey for everyone. So I think it's really time for us to create that education strategy which embraces what's happening at the local level. Um, then the the next thing is to really think about how can we ramp up the tech and the admin support. So one of the cool things, and if you go to the the um, rolling notes document, our virtual flip chart, you will see a number of uh, one of the earlier conversations we had is who's giving what resources. So we've got a number out a number of ch- uh, organizations out there that are doing, for example. Um, they're, they're, they've secured um, Zoom accounts, or they've got, a, they've got a master account that they share amongst their chapters. They're extending their licensing for their web, other web platforms. Um, we've got folks like John Bellotti who is putting together just incredible documents that share and teach and coach their, their, um, his, his leaders going through those kinds of uh, – going through the, the transition to, to virtual. Um, we had a number of – we had a, another association talked about giving, getting people online and teaching them just some quick tips on how to make the virtual experience better. Um, I know myself, I've been uh, done for a couple of organizations for their leaders, just a real quick 30 or 45 minute webinar on here's five things that you can do to make sure your board meeting is engaging so you don't lose the volunteers. So there's lots of things you can do in terms of ramping up how you are supporting. And I think the third thing, the fourth thing, excuse me, and this I can't tell you, I think we have to pause and um, and celebrate. I think we have to really um, highlight the, um, the activities that our chapters are doing at the local level. Um, one of the things that we are going to show at our, um, at our annual meeting session for ASAE is this incredible video that um, AGC put together highlighting all the things that were happening at the chapters. I've seen like the like uh, camp, the the marriage and family therapist. I've seen that they've done a good job of doing some shout outs in the chat. How are you 
celebrating the folks that are doing amazing things. I mean, like, do you have a, do you have a, you know, big thank you on the website? Do you have a, I don't know, a, a, a letter that goes out to all the chapter leaders saying thank you for hanging in there? I don't know what you do, but go ahead and um, and throw in the chat. We have to celebrate the efforts that are happening so that we can build the passion to be able to try this uh, some additional things. Um, yeah, Joy is talking about the fact that exhibitors are challenging, and um, and there's there's lots of there's lots of um, conversation around that. Um, I think that um, we're gonna have to rethink that, right? I don't know how many of our chapters are going to be able to do the kind of exhibit spaces they did. So I'd like to see some creative thoughts on those. All right, so. Just real quickly, what we've done is um, shared with you the five lessons learned that, that we reflected back to what um, to what you have said before. And so, just as a you know, a, a, a real quick um, recap of those, we talked about the um, really this notion of the fact that people in reserves are so critical, and it's helping people, it's helping our chapters navigate the mental flexibility to pivot. Um, we talked about the blurring lines of, ge of ge geography around the education conversation. We talked about the fact that local has become increasingly critical. And we also talked about the fact that the traditional chapter is a heavy lift for folks, and, and, and it, we're seeing some moving around that. So then um, it makes sense for us to think about the acting as giving more support in both the um, training and development and the tech and admin, having that integrated education strategy and celebrating. All right. Now, we want to get talking with you, um, between you and among you, on what we right. So are you guys ready? I've got like almost every one of you have voted. So I think that's pretty cool. So let me show you what we came up with. So the top question is in what ways could or should you change how you support the chapters? That's number one. So we'll do that. It's a close one between the virtual education and the successes in the chapters. But it does, how do you take the successes in your chapters and replicate them into other chapters? So the two questions are, in what ways could or should you change your support for chapters? How do you take what is successful in the field and replicate it in the other chapters? Okay, guys, got those questions? Yes, Peggy. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm okay, going to throw so them we're about in the to go chat. Into our rooms. Go ahead. And we're going to go into our rooms. Uh, please make sure that um, if you bring a drink in with you, that you don't leave the drink in the room after you are all done because I have to, I'm the one who has to go in there and clean all the mess up. Um, and we're going to have about 15 minutes. Peggy? Yes. And we all good with that? Everybody good with 15 minutes? Does that sound like a reasonable amount of time? Um, and I guess with that, we're all set to go. So please hold your nose, take a deep breath. <gasps> Here we go. Bye. <laughs> Were there any ahas? Did anybody go, oh, I hadn't thought of that before. That might be really cool. Well, we all thought ah. we could be doing a little bit more uh, for our chapters, but given the structure of the chapters that we have for the most part, which are separate legal entities, which make their own decisions and do their own things, and we don't have any oversight over that, it made it a little more difficult for us to be able to have an impact in the way we wanted to. So um, we, we were happy in our group to understand there are more of um, us out there with the same problem. <laughs> The one thing I shared in that group is that our chapters are separate entities and they always ask us, can you give us something that we can give to our members? And usually the answer is like, no, because then we're not, you know, respecting the membership dues at our level if we just give everything away to your members who may or may not be members. But in light of COVID, we launched all of these webinars and resources and made them free to all members for the good of the industry. And we told our chapters and they were sending it out in their newsletters. We gave away a ton of free content, so which garnered some support from our chapters. Um, also gave us huge um, bump in membership. So we got some nice. membership applications as a result, which was really nice. It, 
So, Diana, do you think it'll be hard to come back from that? Do you think it's going to be? And, and I guess it's a question for the group. Is they've got everybody's gotten used to free webinars. You know, where where does this go? Does everything become free? What happens? Yeah, and see, they had their own webinar programs too. But what they didn't have, our chapters don't have their own in-house council. And that's what we had that is a big differentiator. And so to be honest, almost all of our webinars featured our legal team with some outside counsel that they work on. And that's just the subject matter expertise that our chapters don't have in house. So we gave a lot of legal guidance for free. Mm -hmm. We did the same big. thing um, here. Um, and we didn't charge for any of that, but we're, we're going to continue not charging for the webinars, but we are going to utilize our sponsors, our, our industry partners to help sponsor those and give those industry partners the exposure to our audience that they're looking for that they can't now get in person. So we were just having that discussion, provide our best content, don't charge people to attend and have the sponsor kind of support it and shore it up. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's motivating in our industry, hotel sales, marketing revenue, 70 to 80% of our volunteers are laid off or furloughed still um, is so our membership is a one global membership, which then you can select a chapter, but our chapters are their own entities, is we are still paying our rebates, which I know our co other our other associations are not. And so they have to do everything per the chapter assessment report, which we have um, in order to receive their rebate. So it's not it's been a bigger motivator than in previous years for them to really stay engaged. Um, so to get their bi-yearly rebates. One thing that I'm thinking about this, one thing um, when this all started, we were talking in an effort to tell our chapters about the chapter award deadlines earlier, which is what they told us they wanted, give us more time to get our submissions in. When we first brought it up, they panicked. They're like, we're in the middle of COVID. We have no idea how can we, we're not doing anything like everything's changing but then what we started doing is we were launching all of these new programs that would qualify under the new innovation award you've had you're giving stuff you're doing free membership mm. trial periods for three months that qualifies under the membership engagement award these are all things and so we took these new things that they've done and fit them into our chapter award categories the new ones and they realized that they actually had really strong entries we still postponed right. it, the award um nomination time for a little bit, just because of the current situation, give them some more time to get their ducks in a row. But they realized that at first they were like, we've done, we're, we're gonna do nothing because they weren't having their annual meeting the way they normally do all of these things. And then they realized they actually had really strong entries. Yeah. Yeah, we just so altered our, our entire chapter awards program. Go ahead, we Jill, our, what? We just altered our entire chapter awards program because um, our chapters are super focused on, am I gonna get my award this year? Um, and it's nothing more than, you know, bells and whistles. It's not monetary. It's, you know, essentially bragging rights. Like we've gotten our chapter award X number of years in a row. Um, <laughs> but with the fact that everything that we, most everything that we do is tied to physical things. I mean, we are architects, engineers, and construction people. So we're used to being together. Um, and since it's all virtual, we sort of modified it. And um, I literally just sent that out at 11 o'clock. And I, so far, I've gotten no pushback, which is wonderful. I was, I was waiting for like, how are we going to do this? But we literally told them like, look, you, if, depending on your size of your chapter, do X number of tasks in any aspect of the program and you will get your, your chapter award. So I think they're pretty happy with it. Um, and they feel like, okay, we're still going to get the recognition that we are supporting the organization. We're supporting the strategic plan because that's how our chapter program is designed. Um, hmm. We've also been doing a lot more uh, free webinars for members at the national level, which of course helps keep members engaged. We're sort of in, I forget who it was, said that they have the chap their pr chapter program is basically like you have to join the national and then you pick a chapter. That's how we're designed. Um, so that is also helping keep people engaged and we're providing content that a chapter just isn't going to be able to provide um, just through our connection. Yeah. So, Jill, one right. thing to add, you made me think of this because our members like our awards programs really for bragging rights, but because we're going to do the awards ceremony virtually this year, right. we're actually going to invite them to invite their membership oh. to see them get this award because 
Usually like it's a that. closed door. It's like all of the chapter boards get oh, to see the others, nice. but um, like see me win here. Like if you, if, if your members really care about this award as much as you tell me they care about it, then they might want to come see why you won yeah. and what other ideas they are. So um, we're going to open it up to allow their, yeah. them to share with their members. Yeah, we do those at our annual conference so, and, and really the I only reason anyone attends is because we hold it during lunch. So not as big a deal so for people Diana, who aren't that, getting an award. Yeah, this is something of a tangent, but this is something that I've, uh, you know, Peggy and I've, I've talked about a lot, and that is that our, our chapter leaders and their members, for, quite frankly, tend to live in a box that is defined by their industry or organization. And I keep thinking it would be great. I mean, what we're doing here with this, this program is bringing a lot of CRPs from a lot of industries and professions together in the same box. We don't do that with chapter leaders. And they all have this notion of themselves as being this extremely unique, you know, nobody else is like that, nobody shares our pain, nobody understands what we do. And I always feel like if, they, if we could find a way to bring chapter leaders into the same room and let them hear each other and hear this conversation, I, just, I, I think that would, that would open some eyes in ways that we have not been able to do as CRPs. Uh, and, and I think it could, could bring some real value to mm. the association communities that they, they represent. And I, I'm, I'm not sure of the mechanics of that, uh, but, and, and maybe, maybe this is something for us to put on our plate. And let's think yeah. about this going down the road. Is there a way that we could maybe make this kind of thing happen, have a, an event that's for chapter leaders? And, of course, we could be there, but it really is their opportunity to hear from each other. I, like I love idea. it. And I... I've been on a webinar where there were chapter presidents or president elects on it. And I came as an association person. They're like, I'm actually I, in my breakout room. I was with two people that were on the board of their chapter. Um, and so I've seen it done and it was, sorry. Go ahead, Jenny. I was going to say one thing I was hoping to do pre COVID. So GBTA and MPI are sister associations and having the chapter representative, mm -hmm. those two associations, come to our leadership conference and then we'd go to theirs and we'd do a panel yeah, nice. during the leadership conference. So you'd hear from yeah. others. Now that's not at the leader level, but it's at least hearing from others yeah. in a different perspective. We do that here, right. Peter. Um, there's a local organization right. that gets chapter leaders together and it works really well. We, I do it for our own chapters, but then mm -hmm. um, recently I went down to Florida with my dad, who's the president of a condo owners association. And I had to advise while I was there because he does this, he's, you're experiencing the same problems that I have from an educational chapter perspective. So it's been pretty interesting. Right. Yeah. I think it's a yeah. great idea, Peter. Yeah. We could funnel you the topics from what we're hearing well, from all of our chapters. Yeah. One, it, it, Peter, yeah. one of the ways it's that- thinking like a, It's thinking like a chamber of commerce. Right. I, I think one, sorry, one yeah, easy ahead. way to start that conversation might be for um, to, to look at someone who's closely related to your industry and then have the chapter leaders, you know, right. the, like yeah. in the case of, right. of AIA, you know, I should, I should have my officers talk to Jill Murphy's people, you know, we're architects, mm -hmm. we've got engineers and architects and construction mm -hmm. and, and, you know, try to open up ways for them to talk. And especially right now, I think that if there are organizations that are in in the in the EDI space, we have uh, NOMA, which is the National Organization of, of Minority Architects, and I think that that mm -hmm. there is yeah. a lot of movement in our organization to get the leaders of those two uh, chapter built uh, groups to really exchange ideas. They do things differently in a lot of cases. There's a lot of similarity, and I think that. The, Talking to people in your industry because we're all facing the same economic, similar and related economic mm -hmm. pressures, I think could be super, super. Right. Nice. Yeah. And to yeah. throw into that yeah. little bit of a conversation specifically to you, Anne, you know, our um, our 23 year old is oh, yes. um, a member of <laughs> He's a member. out in California. <laughs> And um, he really um, is put this, the whole, I mean, the, the pandemic was an issue, it is an issue, right? But his, he wants to see his national organization and his chapter 
and not only embrace, but to be a leader in this conversation around the protests. And um, it's kind of interesting because he and I, or Peter, the three of us, we have conversations about how are you doing this? What are you looking at? Who are you talking to? Where is it going? Um, and so I, I think the thing that I'm learning is that the next generation, this is this is something they're really, this is their, their power to it, and they are looking to the associations. And we have this opportunity to embrace this whole generation in a way that we may not have had that door open prior to this. And I, I just think, I think it's, I think, and the, the fact that you're talking about getting the sister organization of the minority act together, I mean, I think that's, ugh, that's cool. Yeah. That's yeah, I now feel like I, I need to get out to all our strategic partners. We have a, a bunch of strategic partners, some are sort of associations. I mean, AIA is one of them, SMPS, which is a, a yeah. you know, a marketing group um, that serves our industry. There's a bunch of them, um, Association mm -hmm. General Contractors. I feel like, yeah, it might be a great idea to see if we can get their chapter people and our chapter people to kind of powwow. <laughs> yeah, call, 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 you too, call. Listen, guys, I, I would, I mean, I don't mind keeping the conversation going, um, but it is 109, and we try to be respectful of people's time, and also I have to facilitate the A. I don't know if you guys know this. ASADE is doing a. <laughs> On top of this, at 2 o'clock, they have a CEO roundtable on what's next for chapters. It just happened to be the same day. So they've asked me to, to facilitate the panel at 2 o'clock, um, and it's a free. If you're an ASAE member, you can probably still go up and get in there. But um, I do want to be cognizant of the time. Uh, this has been a, a great conversation. My group had a, had a good conversation. We shared some ideas in there. So um i'm going to go ahead and and sort of wrap us up so people can get on to other things but um we will be back in the saddle in september for another virtual swap and um of course of course i'll get contact information out i've only had two people who asked please to not do that and we'll get it out and then um we expect like ann and jill to call, and we expect a couple of the other ones tracy okay. and folks to the call, okay, and let us know how we can help um, keeping this conversation moving forward because obviously it's kind of exciting stuff to us. And um, what anything else before we before we hit the leave button? No, it's just always fun to hang out with everybody here. That's why we don't want to leave. Yeah. It's a good time. <laughs> I know. I I have to leave, but thank you guys for everything. Yeah. It's yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. Good. Thank you guys. Thank you. Um, it's, it's always a Thank great you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Everybody, take stay safe and, and wear your mask. Stay safe and wear your mask. <laughs>